a little later on people showed up and we have hot campuses this is what we call the uh, mock apartheid wall and you see this red flag filled with blood and everything it's it's, it's pretty uh, terrible sight uh, if you if you could categorize IU what would you say it was Apathetic? Positive. Positive. Positive? Somewhere between the two. Yeah. So we'll say that, um, I, I would say that um, IU is an apathetic campus because the general population on your campus doesn't, it's not really involved on either sides. They're, they don't really want to know or, or understand what's going on. And, and like we said, you know, we have a representation of, of Jewish students. I've asked how many of you are active and, you know, some of you did raise your hand, but most of you didn't. So that's a, that's a perfect example for an apathetic campus. Uh, for me as a, as a campus professional, which campus would you say is the one I'm more, most worried about? UC Irvine. Well, not specifically a campus, one of the three, <laughs> which one? Oh. Thank God Irvine is not my, my reason, so I don't care for Irvine at all. Otherwise you wouldn't sleep it, no? Just go driving back and forth from California, but... Um, so out of the three, which one of the three is the one that kind of bothers me? keeps me up at night. Uh, apathetic. apathetic campuses. Because when I have a hot campus, I know what's going on, okay? I understand who, I, who I'm up against, what I need to do, I have a plan. Rather, if I don't, it's an apathetic campus, I don't know, yeah, I'll give you, uh, one second. Okay. I'll give you, um, if I don't, um, then I don't know what's going on. I don't know if an SJP is gonna start tomorrow and they're gonna go very aggressive and then I have to find all the pro-Israel students and. There's, there's not a whole lot of them, or they, they're just doing other things. So for me, an apathetic campus is the one that I really need to keep follow all the time. Yeah. Can you just move the computer? I can't see this. Oh, right. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I tried it. Is that okay? Yeah. Can you see it now? Hmm? All right. So. Talking a little bit about the BDS movement, and I know that it hasn't been very active on your campus, but how many of you have heard about BDS before, in general? So the fact is that a lot of you have heard about it before, it just shows you how um, widespread uh, just the term, thanks, uh, the term um, BDS is on, our, on the media, and we hear a lot, a lot about it. And the idea of, of BDS, uh, BDS comes from boycott, divestment, and sanctions. So uh, boycotts, everybody knows what a boycott is? Right, um, divestment means pull out investment. So the opposite from investing. So if you're investing in something, we want you to stop divesting. Investing and sanctions is like have you heard about Iran lately? The sanctions on Iran, it's it's all over the news. So that's boycott, divestment, and sanctions. The things that we care more about on campus is the boycott and and uh, the investment part. Uh, you can't do it on TV. The boycott and investment part. Uh, because you really, really can't do anything with sanctions on campus. It's more on uh, the, the, uh, the federal government level. Um, and that's what they're doing, and they're using, instead of a, a weapons that they've using, used in the past against Israel, they're using words and images and actions. Now, my question to you is, if you had seen these images, <coughs> but instead of saying boycott Israel, it was just black here, there was nothing here. And again, nothing here about Israel. And I got nothing here about Israel. Just these images. Give me one word that comes to your mind when you see these images. Just one word. War. War. What else? Death. Death. What else? Guys, what comes to your mind when you see these images? Evil. Which evil? evil. Discrimination. Discrimination. Like, particularly at the uh, Israeli flag. Uh, and the no. So, okay, yeah. so I guess that could call for discrimination. What else comes to your mind when you see these images? Hate. Hate. Terrorism. Terrorism. But what type of terrorism? Who's the terrorist? It's without the words. Well, but, right, so we're not, when we're saying terrorism, for us as, as Jewish people, we usually think of people terrorizing against Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Or against Western values. But once you think terrorism and then the word Israel comes in, oh, so Israel's a terrorist, right? So for me, I, I agree with everything that you said here. And the one word that comes to my mind is very simple. It's the word bad, right? For me, something's bad's going on, right? I don't even know what's going on, but I know that it's bad. And that, for, for a student on your campus, 
that doesn't really have any connection to Israel, they don't really understand Israel very much, to see these images, for them it's like, all right, something gets stuck in their head, something's bad going on. Now, as I said, there are um, a few organizations that are involved. Um, on college campuses, we see two major organizations. One is right here, um, Students for Justice in Palestine, War Active on your campus. The other one is right here on the top called Jewish Voice for Peace. It's a Jewish organization, but it's a very strongly anti-Israel organization. Uh, they're not very active on your campus, uh, but we see them a lot on other campuses, mostly in the Pacific Northwest, in Chicago, they're very active. So we see them as well. Uh, those groups are being sponsored by a whole lot of uh, other organizations, including uh, AMP, the American Muslims for Palestine, who are lucky for us, are based right here in Chicago. Um, and uh, they do a lot of the training. So just as we at San Luis do training for students, uh, we're, we just have our training uh, in two weeks uh, in LA for students. They do their training. Uh, weird enough, they do in California as well. I don't know why everyone's going to California for training. But uh, they do a lot of training for students. And so what we need to understand is that we, if we have an SJP on our campus, those students are not acting on their own. They have a larger organization, a national organization that leads them and gives them advice on how to do things. And that's why even if we have an SGP that's not very active this year, it could be very possible that one of their students went to their national conference and came back with a lot of ideas and thoughts and resources. And so next semester they can start and they can start very strongly. So unfortunately we're not safe uh, just because this uh, uh, semester not a lot has happened. Talking a little bit about things that happen on campuses. This is an example from U of I, um, for University of Illinois. <coughs> this guy over here, his name is Steven Salada. Have you heard, has anyone heard that name before? Steven Salada, is, have you heard that name? Yeah. He is a, um, a professor, originally came from Virginia Tech. He teaches um, Native American studies. And during the last summer, during the operation that Israel had in Gaza, uh, he was very, very active on Twitter, and you can read some of his tweets that he had during and what that made us understand, us people on our side, students on campus, the fac other faculty members, et cetera, is that students cannot feel safe going to his class if they're Jewish or if they're pro-Israel because he will definitely fight those students. Um, and that could be a major problem. Uh, having such a professor, even before he got, um, um, you know, to, to go and to teach, we already know that we need to be afraid of him. Not only that, they offered him a 10-year contract. And for those of you who know a little bit about how academia works, once a professor gets tenured, it's almost impossible to get rid of him, no matter how awful they are. So that, always, that sometimes causes a problem. Can you, uh, <coughs> University of Chicago offered him that? No, University of Illinois. Illinois. Oh, I see. In Champaign. Um, the crazy thing about this guy, Steven Salada, is that, like I said, he's a Native American studies professor. He published six books in his academic career. Um, five of them talk about the Palestinians, and one of them compares Native Americans to Palestinians. Um, so he doesn't do a lot of work, actually, in the field of Native Americans. Uh, that's why everyone were very confused why he got a 10-year contract. Um, the university, uh, the, the, the chancellor and the president of the university fought him uh, they would not uh, take it, uh, offer him a contract, and um, thankfully he he didn't get into the university. He's still fighting them in the courts. Bless you. So I really hope that he's not gonna uh, make his way back into university. But that's an example of a professor. And if he had uh, gone in to teach at the university, can you imagine the amount of professor disputes we would have had every every week? We would have got a phone call from a student. I said uh, something, you know, about uh, you no, know, let's studied about Native Americans and my professor completely went all out on me because we're, he's obviously capable of seeing the things that he's saying. Another, other things that we see on uh, university, and obviously that's the major activity, is activity that comes from students. Um, you can see some of these examples um, far uh, top right uh, up over there is um, from University of Michigan. Um, that's what's called an eviction notice. People wake up in the morning, it's a piece of paper under their door. It says in three days, the university is gonna demolish this building, and you have three days to find somewhere else to live. Um, take all your stuff and go. So can you imagine you live in the dorms and you get, <laughs> most universities, usually it's freshmen who live in the dorms, right? Is that LIU as well common? So can you imagine a freshman 
uh, and it was very early in the year so they just got to the school a couple of months ago they get this they don't know that it's a joke they get freaked out and about 10,000 students <laughs> got that uh, and they get really freaked out only at the bottom very small print it said oh this is what Palestinians have to go through every day by the Israeli government this is not a real addiction of this can you, you can imagine how stressful it was another thing that uh, we see that's called a sit-in um, they'll go and, and many universities, I, I'm sure that IU is like that as well, a professor can choose to teach their class wherever they want. So if they want to teach in a cafeteria or on the, on the grass outside, or in a, if, you have a, if you have a diag or something like a center area, right? So they can teach there if they want to. The university is not going to tell a professor uh, where to teach. Um, and so uh, uh, anti-Israel professors decide to teach their class in the center cafeteria of the school. And so for hours, they just sit there and they teach their class, but it's nothing about the academic material. It's all about anti-Israel hatred. And everyone who's going to grab coffee or a sandwich or whatever has to go through that class <laughs> here. It's a great example of how you just get mass amount of people hear what you have to say. Uh, these are other examples, uh, mock checkpoints. And like I said, apartheid, well, I'm sure you've heard these things before. They did it in the center of the university. You go to class, you gotta go through that. You gotta see the show. And it's, it's not always a pleasant show. This is from Loyola University uh, in Chicago. This is a silent protest. Behind them, you can't see, but people are signing up for birthright. And so no one can reach the table because they're blocking the table completely. And if you want to go, you got to go through these people. So the protest was silent, but it definitely wasn't, was not violent. It was a very violent protest. Um, and uh, they have names of people who were killed in the operation in Gaza on their shirts. Yeah. Do you, do you like just have to push through or what? To be honest, think about yourself. You're not gonna, you know, to sign up. Definitely today, yeah, you can do it on your laptop. No one's gonna start a fight with anyone for a birthright sign up. But the fact is that a lot of students, if they, if you don't drag them to the table to come and sign up, they won't sign up. And so I'm sure a lot of students at Loyola didn't go on birthright that uh, that season, that winter, that was past winter, because they were afraid and they didn't want to cross. And probably they heard a lot of very vicious things coming from these people about them going to birth Well, and if you think, if we have an apathetic campus, um, if this happens on our campus, then um, someone who doesn't know much about Israel and is kind of thinking about going, but they see this, they say, wait a second, there's so much I don't know about this, and they say, I'm not gonna sign up for birth because I don't know what this is. It, it creates a whole new complexity that um, Absolutely. might be scary and intimidating to, yeah. to approach. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Think again, when you have an apathetic campus, it doesn't mean that people don't want to know. It just, just means that they don't know. And that's fine because no one cares to tell them. But if they go and they see any of these things on their campus, they're going to sit and listen for two minutes and they're going to he hear a lot of hatred coming from these groups. And so it could be very, very difficult for them to, to think, you know, to say, oh, but I know Israel, when they actually don't know Israel. And that's probably all they're hearing. Yeah. And I think with the apathetic campus, actually, I can't remember exactly how you broke it down, but if I'm not mistaken, I think there's an extra class, uh, an extra spot in the classification because some campuses, and I think ours is, have some very, very passionate students who are really not apathetic. I mean, like the, right. you know, like the Ryan Fidel and the Jesse and the Kira and the people on stand with us and the Hasbara fellows and the APEC students. And they're very, very passionate and not apathetic. But then the overall larger campus is apathetic. But I'm sure that right. you have some campuses where you don't even have that core group of very passionate students. Absolutely. So it's probably so, another yeah. subset of your classification. So we can obviously classify a lot of different. Yeah. When we talk about that classification, we talk about the general population. Right. Not about just a, a, a group of students. Even if they're very active, if the general population is not really uh, communicating with them, it's still considered an apathetic campus. Yeah, no, no, I agree. So like you could see in that picture, there was a girl there and she might've had a lot of friends with her who was tabling, but no one was approaching her table. And we might just, you know, kind of forge that picture and maybe I told people to <laughs> just so we can have the picture. To move to the side. I can't tell you, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's actually a very old uh, photo. Um, another thing, and again, this is uh, divestment at DePaul University here in Chicago. Um, this is an example of how they hijack other movements' causes. Um, I'm sure 
everyone in this room have heard about Black Lives Matter, about hashtag I can't breathe, hashtag hands up, right? Have you heard about a lot of those? Um, if you read these flyers, Tell uh, us more about them. So I'll say yeah, so if you read these flyers over here, you'll see that instead of talking about the African American struggle for equality in this country, it talks about the Palestinian community um, being um, you know attacked and brutalized by the Israeli occupation. Um, the fact is that uh, if you remember uh, the demonstration we had a year ago in Ferguson, Right, if you see, I'm sure all of you have seen something on the news about that. Uh, about three weeks, I think, into the demonstration, they had a really long march, a big march in, uh, across the city or, or the town, and uh, they had a, a big sign that they were holding saying, from Ferguson to Palestine, occupation is a crime. Um, there was a march, again, by African Americans. There were a lot of people from SJP within that group talking about Palestine there. Um, which, you know, a lot of bad things happen in Ferguson. I could totally agree to that. Occupation is definitely not one of them. We can definitely agree that people in Ferguson are not occupied, right? So the word occupation was kind of implemented uh, into that uh, struggle that they're having. It was all about really hijacking that cause. Same thing with the Latino uh, groups on campus that have <coughs> uh, are, are working together with SJP and now the idea of the, of the wall that they're um, considering building between the Mexico and the United States, that's a classic comparison to the security uh, barrier in Israel. And again, think of the idea is that why is the United States um, considering that wall? Why is Israel building that? Um, it, it, it's not really the same reasons, but nevertheless, they, both countries have good reasons why they're doing it, agree with it or not. Um, they have their reasons that they're trying to do it. Nevertheless, it's all about how uh, the Latino students and the, and the Palestinian students are the same. Same thing with uh, gay rights, and again, every time you go and you talk about gay rights in Israel, and you rightfully say things about how you, you can't really be openly gay uh, and be a Palestinian, living in a Palestinian authority. You can. Um, if you're not uh, hung of, of, of a crane of, of, for doing it, then your family's probably gonna say you put shame on us and they're gonna try and kill you. Um, it's a fact, we've seen these things happen, it's very sad. There are safe houses in uh, Jerusalem and in Haifa, areas where there's mixed population uh, run by um, Israelis that are uh, accepting Palestinian and gay men, it's mostly gay men, uh, but there's one, I, I, I actually heard it in an anti-Israel lecture, there's one in Haifa as well for gay women. Um, for, uh, for lesbian women and um, yeah, but gay men are uh, Palestinian gay men have to flee the Palestinian Authority and come into Israel um, so they can uh, be safe from their family trying to murder them. But if you try to bring that on campus, you're accused of pinkwashing. You heard about pinkwashing before? Um, that's an example of what they do. So you can't talk about anything positive about Israel because you're actually trying to avo avoid the issue of the Israeli occupation, as they say. So a lot about how they hijack causes. Any questions? I'm, I'm, I know I bombarded you with a ton of information. Can you talk about the impression as well? Yeah. yeah. So again, the idea, and, and now we have a, a lot of types of washing going on, whitewashing and greenwashing. Uh, all the colors are being washed. <laughs> the idea um, that they're bringing with pink washing is that every time you as a pro-Israel activist try to talk about uh, LGBT life in Israel, in a positive way, or talk about um, the aid that Israel is, is giving, you know, the, again, uh, the LGBT community from the Palestinian Authority, you're trying to wash away the actual issues, which are um, the occupation, so, and the violence that Israel is implementing. So, the, they call it pinkwashing. And again, if you talk about environmental issues, then you're greenwashing, and et cetera, et cetera. So, choose a color, you can wash it somehow, okay? <laughs> So the uh, last thing about um, things that happen on campus is divestment. I'm sure many of you have heard this term divestment before. It's been widespread in our region, unfortunately, in the last couple of years. Uh, several universities um, have, have gone through that. The one thing about divestment that I want to make clear before I actually talk about what it is, is that until this very point, no university in the United States has actually divested from Israel. The university has not. 
Any, any thoughts why universities don't choose to divest even though student government passes a divestment resolution? Yeah. It's in their own economic best interest. Like it, it only is gonna further hurt the university. The university makes a lot of money off the investments that they have in Israel. They have a lot of strong partnerships. It's not in their best interest and not in their fiscal best interest to not invest in Israel. Perfect, perfect uh, answer. The bottom line is that doing business with Israel is good business. Um, the Israeli economy is a strong economy. Universities know that they can trust that economy. And so why would a university divest its money from something, from an investment that gives them money back? And the fact is they need that money. They need to build new dorms. They need to build, uh, unfortunately, most of the states in our area can't really give a lot of money to their public universities. And so universities need to use other tools and, and investments are obviously one of them. Uh, that's how you, you guys get your grants and um, get help from the university. Um, so the investment is, is not- And then also, also because they've got educational kind of relationships, they've got professors right. coming from so Israel. So that goes to the boycotts, not to the divestment. Oh, so they do call on boycotts right. and, and I agree with you 100%. No university as a body has actually boycotted Israeli academia. It was more small groups within the university that has done it, but not the administration. Um, oh. So when they do, when they call on the investment, that goes to student government. I know you have, you call it, um, they have a different name for it at your school? I understand. Yeah, correct. Um, um, but in general, it's all a student government and they go to student government and they ask the student government to pass a resolution that's gonna call on the university to divest. It divests from what? Any investment in the state of Israel in general, any investment that goes directly to the Israeli Defense Force, and every uh, uh, company that profits from the occupation, they uh, deliberately don't say what it means to profit from the occupation. It could be very broad term. And um, then they say, this is the pro-peace option. If you wanna be neutral, then you need to stop the investment in investing in the occupation, and then you'll be neutral. You will be actually will be pro-peace because you'll put pressure on Israel. And these are a few examples of universities that has chosen I'm sorry, student governments that has chosen to divest. Uh, some of them, like I said, are from our region. You can see that many of them are from the West Coast. Um, it started in the West Coast and it's slowly but surely moving east. And right now it's stuck right here in the Midwest. And we see more and more universities. You can see here Loyola, and, um, um, Michigan, and Dearborn, and DePaul, etc. So you can see a lot of universities in our region um, where divestment has been introduced, uh, not necessarily passed. Try to listen to the speeches that you'll be recognizing. Thank you are discussing Israel, the last standing apartheid state of our time. Israel, who is war crimes, has divested from humanity. So tonight, humanity itself must divest from Israeli war crimes. The state of Israel has already been criticized for systemically killing Ethiopian women, Ethiopian Jews who happen to be black. Um, vaccines that permanently sterilize them um, without their knowledge. Zionism is the negation of the principles of Judaism. Organ harvesting that's happening in the Sinai desert, which happens with the knowledge of the Israeli government. If you vote no today, you are just as bad as Caterpillar. You're just as bad as General Electric. So, looking at that video, you've, you've heard some things in that speeches. Anything that, you know, popped right up? I didn't care what, they, what the Ethiopian time was. So, um, <laughs> they're giving them vaccines that sterilizes them. For Ethiopian, Ethiopian women who happen to be black. Um, why does that matter? Why is that important that they're Ethiopian women who happen to be black? Aren't they all black? Most well, of the assuming they were built alliances but, but, with the but they don't know the student government. That's I mean, no offense, but I would assume that if we ask a lot of people, you know, general population, where's Ethiopia? Some of them won't, might won't know. So it's important to make this distinction. These are Ethiopian people who happen to be black. Why? Because they're trying to show Israel as like a racist country. So 
they're white people trying to hurt black people, right? So it's something that we can relate to because it's happening in this country as well, right? Yeah. They're, they're trying to insinuate racial, uh, a racial superiority. One thing they always try and say, it's a bunch of uh, Ashkenazi Jews who have uh, colonized Israel when in actuality you have a number of Jews who are from Iran, who are refugees from Egypt, Tunisia, and it's part of their narrative to say it's a bunch of Eastern European colonizers. That's and absolutely. they're trying to say they're, Israel's trying to be white and white only. Absolutely. Um, other things that they talk about there is about organ harvesting. You heard about the organ harvesting? Where is that happening, according to that guy? In Sinai Desert. Sinai Desert. Is that a part of Israel? No. No. It's part of Egypt, right? Uh, I don't know when the last time the Egyptians did whatever the Israelis told them. Probably not very often. So it's something that's happening in the Sinai. I don't know. Also, I don't know happening. what hospitals they do it in, because you can't just organ harvest in... You know, in the middle of a desert. It's, I mean, it's pretty I, complicated. The point is that I don't even know. The point is that it doesn't matter if, if it happens or not. The fact is that no. this guy says it's happening in the Sinai Desert. Let, let's just assume for the sake of the argument that it is happening in the middle of the desert. And why is that Israel's fault? Because Israel knows about it. He says that with the knowledge of the Israeli government. So they're sitting, they know it's happening, and then what? They should bomb Egypt, right? It's still Israel's fault. So it's the fact that no matter what happens, it's it's all about why it's Israel's fault. Yeah? Well, that, ar that argument is completely illogical because he's saying simply because Israel knows, he also knows, and it would insinuate that it's like the way his argument would also mean, mean that it's his fault too. Thank you very much for saying that. You've literally done my work for me. <laughs> Divestment here, you like the one you see here, is not a logical event. It's not about logical issues or consequences. It's about emotions. Okay? You have a lot of people there. Some of these divestment hearings go on for seven or eight hours. You think after the second hour they could care less about what you're saying? Especially if they keep saying the same thing? They can't. But if you twist something in their hearts about those poor refugees, where are those refugees in the Sinai Desert coming from? Sudan and Eritrea, what are they? Poor refugees. They're refugees, they're poor, they're black. They're coming and what happens to them? Their organs are being harvested. I wanna die at that moment when I hear that, right? And now you're telling me that Israel knows, they know and they do nothing? <laughs> Again, no offense, but most people will have no 